At least it's not raining this morning and I didn't get caught in the wrong gate. Um, which is always a good thing. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about um, what we've been doing to mimic uh, and understand what the optics are on the wings of a butterfly. Um, in particular, uh, there are a couple of butterflies, uh, Papilio, uh, belonging to the Papilio family, so I'll, I'll spend some time on these things and, and I'll tell you um, what fascinates me about these. Um, and so this, this work is largely um, collaboration between uh, my group um, and Chris Summers' group in, in material science and engineering. And it's a small world. It turns out Harry knows uh, Chris Summers very well, and uh, Chris and I have been working now for some time. All right. Um, so I already said a little bit about, um, about these butterflies yesterday. Uh, in particular, uh, the Papilio polynurus. Um, and I'll try and tell you how we tried to mimic it using, uh, using a template that we have been spending a lot of time on. And, and that in itself is, is a fairly long talk. It's a completely different, different topic. But if any of you are interested, I'll be happy to elaborate on that. And so what I will tell you um, deals with this. And there will be a little bit of background on, on um, not a whole lot on photonic crystals, but just tell you uh, what they are and, and what Chris Summers has been doing. And I'll tell you one more thing that uh, Pete Bukusik has published on, how this particular butterfly, in fact, has a directed fluorescence coming back because of an underlying photonic crystal um, underneath the wings or wing scales. And those kinds of devices have been made in order to increase the efficiency of uh, fluorescence coming back out in terms of a light emitting diode or in terms of trying to absorb more light for uh, solar cells um, where underlying the substrate, underlying an active substrate there is a photonic crystal therefore propagation of light beam is forbidden in those photonic crystals and, and, and you can then have um, more absorption. Okay, um, and so typically people uh, make, there are a number of ways of making quote unquote photonic crystals and one of the ways is to use colloidal crystals to assemble, assemble these uh, three-dimensional structures and, and the most well-known structure um, early on uh, was the work by uh, Jonathan Sanders, who looked at the structure of opal. Uh, those of you who may have spent a lot of money to buy opals, they are nothing more than nano sand, if you want to think of it that way. Right? So these are silica particles, two sets of two sizes of silica particles that are packed, and and the sizes of these things um, are in a ratio of about. Um, if you look at the diameter ratios, they are about 0.2 with another. So they are essentially, an opal is basically a colloidal crystal that's packed up with uh, silica particles. Right? So it's, that's why I said it's nano sand. You pay lots of money for nano sand. Now, in order to, um, and they've also been studied from a completely different perspective. Um, there are, there's a lot of work on colloidal crystals and colloidal self-assembly uh, per se. <coughs> Um, work by Cherry Murray, uh, who was in the laboratories and who is now um, president or something for Harvard University. Um, uh, she worked a lot on these um, colloidal crystals from the point of view as artificial atoms. You know, so you can you can pack these colloidal crystals in a variety of variety of architectures, and then you can look at the dynamics of these things because you can make particles that are analogous to atomic structures. All right. Um, and so the reason people want to study these things, um, you essentially make, uh, make a colloidal crystal array, you pack them out, and you fill the interstices with some other material that you care to, and then you burn away your template. Uh, your template happens to be a polystyrene bead or something else, 
and then you create uh, create what's known as a uh, inverse opal. Uh, and there are lots of people who've been doing this. And the usual justification is we can make uh, selective photonic band gap materials. In other words, light does not propagate in, in, in that medium. You can presumably make a negative index material, uh, although I'm not going to say a whole lot about those. And from electrical engineers in particular are interested in a variety of devices. I don't particularly care about devices. Um, that's just the way it is. Uh, but it's, it's here just to show you that these are uh, being looked at quite seriously and, and they use methods of self-assembly of colloidal crystals to, to make these structures. One problem, of course, if I'm going to pack all these spheres, I am always going to have packing defects. Uh, those of you who have looked at a book called Soap Bubbles would have seen a beautiful paper by uh, uh, Drag and Nye in 1947 where they made bubble wraps out of soap films. Right? So these are soap bubbles that pack as colloidal crystals would, except they are soap bubbles. And then you can look at uh, the optics of that and look at, look at that as a model system for, uh, uh, for atomic packing in, in metals. And it turns out if you pack those things, you will always have grain boundaries, you will always have missing spheres, you will always have defects in them. And so the question is, how do you control those defects? Um, there are a number of people who use, then make, make these kinds of inverse opal structures and then coat them uh, with materials that are of interest, either titania or alumina, um, using atomic layer deposition, right? just to tune the optical properties of the materials. And then, of course, there is a different, slightly different technique by uh, Turberfield, uh, who introduced, you can make these holographically defined polymer templates out of photoresist, and you have six or eight beams or 12 beams, however many beams you would create a holographic pattern in a photoresist, and you make whatever structure that you, that, that you desire. You do the calculations for what the band gap will be, and then you create that structure using, using a photoresist. Uh, this is just there as a background. I'm not going to say a whole lot about any of these. Okay, so we will use atomic layer deposition, and as I understand it, um, it's a it's it's a variation of chemical vapor deposition. And those of you, if you don't know what chemical vapor deposition is, if you if you just flip your uh, cup open, uh, you basically have moisture that has condensed on the surface. And that's basically chemical vapor deposition. I'm depositing moisture from the vapor phase as a liquid phase. And this is also studied in the context of breath figures. If you, if you take your glass and you breathe on it, you will have moisture condensing. Of course, you won't if you had drunk a lot of beer like I did last night. Right? So, uh, because your breath is devoid of moisture. Um, and so, in this particular case, what you do is you deposit the material of choice, um, in this case, either um, titania, uh, titanium chloride, and you deposit these on, on a substrate that, of course, coats on wherever uh, there is a free surface. You purge that with nitrogen, you wash it off with, with water, and you eventually create titania. Um, what form of titania you, you create? I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, but, but there's essentially there are ways of getting at um, both forms of uh, titanium. And the nice thing about atomic layer deposition is you can coat any surface um, with the precision of about one, uh, one angstrom, two angstroms or so, uh, so that you can build layers of materials that, that you choose to do so. Right? So you can deposit titania, alumina, titania, alumina, um, and things of, things of that nature and create multi-layers. Okay, so what we did, we, we in fact used titania to, to mimic the optics on a butterfly wing, and, and that's, that's why there was this little bit of a preamble. Um, and in particular, the papilio, um, the species papilio, um, I mentioned yesterday this green color is coming from the fact that there is a micro bowl on each of these individual wing scales. You realize each one of these butterfly wings has about, 
has tens of thousands of individual wing scales that are about 100, 150 microns long, um, sort of like this. Um, and they are essentially covered. They are almost like roof tiles that you see, um, see around here. Or if you were in India, you would, in South India, you would see all these roof tiles. And, and they're basically tile-like patterns. And each one of these microbolts, um, in this particular case, um, they're about three to four microns big. And, and they're little micro cups. And underneath the micro cup is a multi-layer, uh, roughly 11, 11 to 12 layers of chitin and air. And that's, that's essentially what's there on this, on this wing scale of the butterfly. There's a little bit of a pigment underneath, but other than that, there's a, there isn't, um, it's just a very absorptive material. And, and you basically have interference conditions. So if I have a light beam that's incident, um, normally it, it sees a certain path length. If I have a light beam that's incident there, it gets retro-reflected retro and goes back up, and the path length for this beam is significantly different because you're looking at the multilayer at a very different angle. Um, and so you will have a certain reflection, and then that reflection again gets refined and then reflected off of that. So you get two, two, retro, two reflections here, one that is incident normal and, and one that, that comes back out. <clears throat> so this is just to show you what, what they may look like. These are all um, um, images, SEM images that uh, uh, Chris Summers provided, uh, provided me. And if you look at the wing scales, this is after a little bit of coating, and, and it, um, um, I'm not sure I would call this a Bragg diffraction, although Chris <coughs> calls it a Bragg diffraction peak, and I let, let that go. Didn't really want to quarrel with them about it, um, and so it's basically coming from from an interference, and, and that's located around 525, uh, 525 or 26 nanometers. Okay, you can model these things, and I'm not going to spend spend a whole lot of time on this. Let me move on to what I want to tell you. Okay, um, so you can take each one of those individual wing scales, and then code them. Um, with titania or alumina or whatever you, you care to coat them with. Right? So this is what they uncoated um, for this particular butterfly wing, the, the Papilio blumii. Um, that's what the uncoated wing scale looks like under a reflected light microscope. And if I have a 10 nanometer coating of uh, either titania or alumina, of course, depending on what the material is, the color will be different because the refractive indices are different. Um, so you get you get a visible change in the color. So you basically take the wing as a substrate and put it in the ALD machine and coat it for uh, a couple of hours, and, and you know what the thickness ought to be, um, and you can modify modify the optical properties of these materials by by atomic layer deposition. Now, what I want to spend a little bit of time on is this particular. Um, Species, this particular butterfly, the Papilio polynurus. So at 3x magnification, this is what the individual wings, this is what the wing scale looks like. So this is, I don't, I don't remember how big this butterfly is. It's about, it's about as big as my hand. Right? Uh, so that gives you an idea of, of the scale of this. And if I look at it closely at 3x magnification, you find all these little. Um, little individual wing scales that uh, that are green that appear green in color, and as you increase um, here is 5x, you begin to see uh, blue tinges. At, at 20x, you in fact begin to see blue and and yellow, and at even higher magnification, so there is at 30x or 50x, you get a blue uh, surrounding um, with an unfocused image of the yellow reflectance from, or yellow or greenish. Um, it looks yellow on my screen, but it doesn't on your screen. And then if I were to take it, take this, and look at it under cross polarizers, you see only the blue reflectance and not the, not the yellow. And the reason for that, and of course, uh, you can tell um, 
only these regions are bright um, and there is an extinction here and that's because that's the direction of the polarizers and if I rotate the polarizers by 45 degrees then this cross would rotate to itself. Right? So uh, what it's telling you is um, you have um, this reflection has been reflected twice and the polarization changes so that when it comes out it's almost as if you have under parallel polarizers. And so you you, um, you extinguish the yellow but you don't extinguish the, the blue. Now uh, yesterday I had a discussion with uh, one of you here about color mixing whether this is additive or subtractive and if you were to take a yellow pigment and a blue pigment and you mix them, you'll get a green color. And, and that's what you see. And in fact, one of the reviewers for my NSF proposal that got funded also said the same thing, that these PIs are complete idiots because they have confused subtractive mixing to additive mixing. And it's not that we have confused it, and I'll show you the evidence for why this, this occurs. Okay. So it turns out these, these butterflies are also, um, uh, if you look at the wing scales, they are, they are quite, uh, quite fluorescent. There is auto fluorescence from them. And, and so here is a, um, uh, a confocal image, um, a 3D structure that shows you what the profile of, these, um, uh, of the individual wing scale looks like. And so you can see the individual micro cups. Um, in, in the in the image, and these these give you the X Z uh, cross section, and this gives you the Y Z cross section, and this is the X Y. So you put them all together to get this three dimensional view. But the reason it's here is just to show you that you can image the features are large enough for you to image them in a confocal light microscope. Obviously, not the multi layers. The multi layers are about 100 nanometers apart. Right, so that's something we cannot resolve in the confocal, and we wouldn't see it. <clears throat> okay. So I've already spent a fair amount of time on this. Um, so this is the this is an SEM from Pete uh, Wukusik's paper, um, and this is the micro cups that I was referring to. So each one of these. Um, uh, so this is what it looks like under a uh, reflected light microscope. And as I said, you get a retro reflection of this, and that's the polarization is rotated twice. And so you can, you can see the blue, and you can extinguish the yellow. So then the question is, why is it when you, if you look up, if you Google additive mixing, and what you will see is a web page that shows you mixing yellow pigments with blue pigments, giving you green. And then you will have yellow light mixing with blue light, giving you white. And if you look at vision, um, there's a scientific American book called Vision by David Hubble, uh, who uh, studied cat's eyes, vision and cat's eyes, and how the brain develops. Um, um, during the growth of a cat, uh, he won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for trying to uncover the visual pathways of a, of a growing cat. So they grew cats in, in the dark and showed that, in fact, if you a, a cat that has a normal eye, if you grow the cat if you in, in the dark, the brain does not have the optic pathway to connect them. In fact, the cat will be blind. Uh, so Kind of unfortunate, but that's that's what they they looked at. Okay, so what we can do, um, we can of course take individual spectra of these things in a microspectrophotometer. And and so what we did was we looked at the um, just the blue reflectance uh, from this in a microspectrophotometer. We can we can do this at, at fairly high magnification, and then you look at only the yellow reflection and ask where does the color points lie on a color chart, on the CAE charts that I talked about yesterday. And so here are the spectra. So for the yellow spot, and this is just a fairly highly magnified image, image of the reflectance. And so we can in fact 
acquire the spectra only from that yellow spot because we can we can do the spectrophotometry at 100x or 200x magnification so that you will see only that and nothing else. And that reflectance looks something like this with a peak around 5, 556 or 557. And you will see it's not a particularly narrow peak. It's, it's about 150, 150 microns wide. And you can do the same thing for the blue. And the butterfly effect is so clever. And, and, and it, it has an ability to, uh, to create a number of different shapes or hues, if you will, depending on what the intensities look like. So here is the blue reflectance. Uh, this really should look blue, but it doesn't look blue on the screen. My apologies. And it was color coded to give you this is yellow and this is blue. OK, so at any rate, you can take this reflectance and calculate what the color coordinates would be, as if it is a yellow light that's coming back to you. And that color coordinate um, is given by that particular point, uh, one, on the, one on the right. And, and the blue, you can again take this and compute the color coordinates and ask, where does that lie? And that's, that's where the blue lies. Now, for additive mixing, if I mix these two, um, if I take these two light sources, if I were to take that light source and that light source, I can then generate a whole host of colors that lies along that particular line. And so what this is showing you, in fact, if we look at the spectra at, uh, at fairly low magnification, this is the color point that we would, we would calculate based on the reflectance spectrum if we look at it at a low magnification. So it's kind of very nice that this yellow combined with that blue um, gives you the color perception that it is, it, is, it is a green, even though it is almost as if you're mixing two sets of light sources. And it does so because of the particular, particular way these, these intensities are related. And the white point, of course, is someplace down here. The, the xy coordinates for the white is 0.33, and so it, it lies, the white point would lie there. And you can see this never passes through the white point. You always get the color perception that it's green. And there is, there is nothing absorbed in this particular, particular species. So it's, it's not necessarily subtractive mixing. It is mixing this blue with this quote unquote yellow to give you. Um, this color mixed um, green state. Okay, so what we wanted to do was, all right, um, um, we needed to mimic this. We, we were interested in mimicking this. How would we do that? Um, and we have been looking at a particular system where uh, we can make these kinds of monodispersed holes in a polymer film. And this, you basically take a very a dilute solution of the polymer. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the mechanistic aspect of this, because that's a completely different issue. And I'll be more than happy to talk to you about it um, if you're interested. So it has about 1% or maybe half a percent polystyrene. Uh, for those of you who don't know what polystyrene is, um, And that's, that's basically it in all your polystyrene cups that, that you drink coffee from. Um, of course, the Japanese immigration and customs wouldn't believe that I was carrying very standard samples of polystyrene and polyisoprene for my friends in, in Japan. So they asked me, what is this white powder? And this was about 15 years ago. And I said, oh, it's a, it's, um, uh, uh, it's a polymer. Said, what the hell is a polymer? Well, it's like your polystyrene cups, you know, you drink coffee from. Uh huh. So you can eat? Yeah, you can. Well, you can chew on it. Chew? So, what, you want me to chew this? Yeah, chew. I'm probably the only person who has chewed on polystyrene polyisoprene <laughs> with lithium salts in it. <laughs> it doesn't taste very good, I can tell you. <laughs> Uh, so at any rate, uh, you can take a very dilute polymer solution and put a drop of it in a glass light. 
and essentially blow on it. Right? So about a minute later, if you take that glass slide and put it under a light microscope in the reflection mode, what you will see are these, are these very nicely ordered array of holes that are precisely the same size. And this is a three-dimensional reconstruction of that film, which tells you each one of these holes are precisely the same size, and they're also very nicely interconnected. And they're all interconnected so that the, you will notice that this part is, is very thin. And so it's easy to tear this film. You can take scotch tape and put it on this film, and you can rip it apart. And what you will do is you will exactly cut the film in half. If you do that, you get a structure that looks like that, which is our micro cups for replicating the, the butterfly wing scales. And the reason this process occurs, um, as I've shown here, uh, just very briefly, those of you who, who have already figured this out, my apologies. So when I'm evaporating the solvent, I cool the solution to about minus 10. I'm sure all of you have done at some point some chemistry laboratory where, where you spilled acetone on your hands and you feel cold at that place because of evaporative cooling. And this solution then cools to about minus 10. You get nucleation and growth of water droplets. And this is the key. Water droplets, these are water droplets that pack, close pack as hard spheres. Now you can ask me why they close pack as hard spheres and I will be here telling you that story for the next two hours, and, and I'm not going to do that. But, but trust me, these pack as hard spheres, and, and that's largely uh, because there is a large temperature gradient between the solution and the water droplets. The water droplets, they condense, and because of the latent heat of condensation, they are actually warm. They're about 40 degrees. The solution is minus 10. And those of you who drink coffee may have seen this. If you stir coffee, every now and then you will see it a coffee drop that runs, runs on the surface. Even though the underlying fluid is coffee, there is a coffee drop that runs on the surface. They won't merge together. And the reason for that is the coffee drop and the underlying coffee have slightly different temperature. If you have a slightly different temperature, you have slightly different surface tensions. And I do not have a cell phone, so it's not me. <clears throat> Um, and so as long as you have a temperature gradient between these two, and as long as there's a um, um, temperature gradient, these two fluids, even though they are the same, they won't merge. And this is known as thermocapillary convection. This is something Osborn Reynolds observed in 1881. And I, I will show you, in, during the break, I'll show you a movie of this. I, I have it somewhere in my files. But at any rate, they, they pack as hard spheres, and the water then templates the polymer to, to solidify around it. And then eventually, these are two, three, four micron water droplets. They also evaporate and go away. And you're left with this ordered array of holes. This is, um, I've given talks where I've said, well, irrational self-assembly is not all hot air. right? So it, it in fact, works because of hot air. Um, OK. So that's sort of schematically shown here. These are the uh, water droplets, and they, they come in contact with the solution. And eventually, the water droplets evaporate, <laughs> peel the structure off, and then you coat them with whatever you want to create the structure that, that you're interested in. So here's what the, what the thing looks like. So we take that ordered array of holes, and we rip the, rip the top off using a scotch tape. And these are our micro cups, and then we run over to Chris Summers' lab. We coat it with atomic layer deposition of titania and alumina, about eight layers each. And once we are done, uh, here is what it looks like. Of course, what, what appears on the butterfly is a heck of a lot better than what we can create at this point. We haven't optimized it for anything. Um, and so here is the, here's the reflection in, in uh, just natural light or in, in polarized light. And on the cross polarizers, again, you can you can see only the edges edges appear blue. Um, and so, what we have essentially done is mimic the optics found on the wing scales of the butterflies. And, and this is not five millimeters; this is five microns. <coughs> and and so, you can tell 
the butterfly thing, butterfly structure was somewhere in that line and, and ours are not horrible, but they're not as good as the butterflies can create them. And so this is this is the yellow reflection and this is the blue reflection and, and <coughs> this is much closer to the white point than than what you find on the on the butterflies. And you can of course compute what the calculated spectra what the spectra should look like and then go and make measurements of those and then okay, there's some reasonable agreement between these. We we need to figure out some refractive index mismatches. Okay. Um, so let me switch gears a little bit and tell you about this work by uh, Pete Bukusik in, in science. And, and this is something that people have used for directing the light emission from, a, from an LED by having a two-dimensional photonic crystal underneath. And, and you have an organic light emitting diode. And if you, all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the fact that if you induce a fluorescent, Fluorescence is completely incoherent and you get emission over 0 to 2 pi. And you want to maximize the fluorescence coming in, in a particular direction. How do you do that? And people have figured this out. What they have essentially done is they have built a two-dimensional photonic crystal underneath a light-emitting polymer diode. And so the emission wavelength is forbidden from propagating in the... In the um, underlying crystal and the underlying photonic band gap crystal and so you essentially get the emission redirected in the in the direction that you want. Now what you find is that you have the same thing in the fluorescent wing scales of the uh, of another uh, another papilio butterfly. And this was done by Pete Bukusik. Um, and so essentially the butterfly wants to maximize the emission going up, and I don't know why it would want to maximize it. You don't want to lose much of the light in other directions in other than the viewing direction. And so what you find is a sort of a quasi-ordered two-dimensional crystal, um, and which, is then, uh, which then has the um, fluorescent pigments in it. And the fluorescence emission, the fluorescent emission is forbidden from propagating in this underlying uh, two-dimensional photonic band gap, and it, it comes out in a, in a directionally, uh, comes out normal to the wing scales. So this is a very nice design that, that, uh, that people have been using, but it's, it's already found on the wing scales of butterflies that, that have been, you know, have, have been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, so you can you can compute what those things, what the photonic band gap for this particular uh, structure ought to be, and what you find is in fact uh, the um, uh, the emission is prohibited from propagating in the underlying two-dimensional crystal. <coughs> this is quite remarkable, um, and if any of you um, are interested in these kinds of um, Studies, you know, look up, look up papers by uh, by Pete Mukusik. Uh, there are a bunch of other guys who, who do this, but Pete, by by far, has been doing this for for a number of years, and, and he's published some really beautiful papers on on a variety of uh, butterfly species. Okay. Um, I don't know whether it's time for me to break here and then talk about beetles, or do you want me to continue? Uh, this would be good time. Okay. So at any rate, I just want to stop here with the um, with looking at and mimicking butterfly wing scales, and, and we have basically used a completely different self-assembly method that we have been working on for a number of number of years now, trying to understand the mechanistic aspect, and use that template to mimic what the optics are on the wing scales of a butterfly. So it's kind of fun for us. So let me stop here and then uh, see if there are any questions. Um, if there aren't, then I'll continue with the beetle story uh, after the break. Questions? Yes. Do you know about ping pong balls? How much do I know about ping pong balls? Good question. See, this is the nice thing about uh, planting a question in the audience to remind me. 
Okay, what I wanted to tell you yesterday, which I forgot, is um, I mentioned that um, there are no <coughs> independent or individual or isolated colors. And everything we see is, is surrounded by something, and, and so we perceive that. And um, one of the experiments to demonstrate that if you have isolated colors, and if you have only those colors visible to you, you will not have a sense of directionality. And so the experiment I want you guys to try, you need two people for this experiment. Right? Someone who is willing to have a flashlight with a color filter, and someone who is willing to break a ping pong ball into two halves. The experiment I want you to try is the following. Break the ping pong ball in half, put it over your eyeballs, and look through, ooh, bad idea. Uh, look through the ping pong ball. Don't look at the ping pong ball, but look through and look, uh, look far away. And your task is not to move your eyes or blink or do any of the normal things you do. Right? So you just basically have to stare past the ping pong ball, sort of like a zombie. And no blinking, no motion of the eyes, nothing. And then ask this person who volunteered to shine, let's say you have light that's blue in color, that we would call blue in color. Ask them to shine it on both the eyeballs. And just keep looking at it. So the question I have for you, and you're not supposed to answer, because I already told you the answer. Um, what do you think will happen after 40 seconds? So you have two ping pong balls over your eyeballs, and there's someone who is, uh, if you heard it from him, I don't want you to answer, but if you didn't, you can. Um, and, and you have blue light, and you're looking through the uh, ping pong ball. What do you expect to see after 40 minutes? I mean, 40 seconds. Hmm? You have two options. What this is this is sort of like a fifty fifty and toss a coin. Yeah, okay. Maybe pink or maybe white. Maybe pink or maybe white, okay? Any other suggestions? When you do this experiment you will find it's neither pink nor white. It will actually be black. Your brain does not know what to do with a signal that does not vary with time. And so the reason we are always moving our eyes, uh, most always, our eyes are never focused on any object for more than maybe three seconds. It always keeps moving. Or you're blinking. Um, the blinking has other functions, but uh, if you do not have a time-varying signal, and your time variation is given either by your blinking or by your eyes looking back and forth. If you do not have that, your brain does not know how to interpret the light that it sees. And it will tell you there is no signal that I can detect. Even though physically there is a person holding a flashlight with a blue filter on looking, pointing that light source on your eyes. This is something the Air Force worries about a lot because when the fighter pilots are up and they up and up at thirty thousand feet, all they see is blue, and so you lose you lose a sense of direction, you lose your visual capacity. If you lose your visual capacity, you lose your mental capacity. These are all problems that that are all too important. Thank you for the reminder. Yes. Actually, I have two questions. Oh. Uh, first one is uh, I'm just wondering what is the role of the refractive index of the material uh, butterfly is uh, built for? Like it's high chip only, and to play with the inorganic materials like the chain of silica or this uh, other polymers. So to what extent are really mimicking uh, what is going on? Well, we mimic the optical effects. I didn't say we mimic the mimic the wing scale of the butterfly, right? We mimic the retro reflection that's found. Um, and by, of course, the, the butterfly does it very beautifully with chitin and air. We have to run, run to somebody's lab and do atomic layer deposition. It's not so much of a great mimic. 
but it is it is mimicking in the sense that we look at what the butterfly is doing and we have created a structure that looks like that. And a uh, second question is, I just wonder if uh, there are any butterfly visuals uh, with uh, switchable uh, color wings, for example. Or if you can there are beetles. There is like a iridescent color and then when it's uh, hiding from a predator. Uh, there, are, there are iridescent beetles that change color. How do they do this? What is the mechanism? Interference. Like a change in the difference? No, they have, they have air pockets in them. And so if they are existing, some of these beetles exist close to rotten bananas. Don't ask me why. Okay. So they want to match the color of their surroundings. And so what you will find is this beetle, when it has water filled in the, in the porous exocuticles, it appears a certain color, and when there is no water, it appears a completely different color. Right? So it's, it, it does do that, but I don't know of any butterflies that do it. So do you try to outperform the nature of the lab and uh, make switchable color structures like this? No, we haven't tried, but we could. But uh, what the, the story I'll tell you next is about uh, beetles that reflect certainly polarized light. And so there are people, there are real applications for those kinds of um, beetles, or those kinds of optics found on the exocuticle for the beetle, not necessarily for the beetle. The beetle is used for, for earrings and necklaces and, and keychains and stuff because it's absolutely brilliantly colored. They are known as jewel beetles because they were used in jewelry. Uh, I don't know if you can buy them in China, but you know I, I bought several keychains in in um, in South Korea last year when I was there for a liquid crystal conference in Jeju Island. So I was walking to a flower shop and they had all these iridescent beetles in in a keychain, and I'm like, wow, I gotta have these. I bought about ten of them. <laughs> Anything else? Huh? Oh, why is the water blue? In fact, that's what led to the Nobel Prize for Raman, which, uh, which he forgot to mention yesterday, perhaps. Um, so one of the few things that Lord Raleigh got incorrect was the fact that water is blue in color, the ocean is blue in color. And in fact, Lord Raleigh has a paper saying why the ocean is blue in color, which has to do with the fact that you perhaps get some of the reflections from, from the sky. And, and uh, C.V. Raman, when he was in a boat, and of course he had polarizers in his pocket. I don't know how many of you got polarizers in your pocket when you travel anywhere, but he did. And, and he also knew that uh, reflection off of a dielectric surface is polarized. This is something, a trick that photographers use to kill the polarization of if they are photographing through a, uh, through a glass window because the reflection is polarized and you can kill that. And so what Raman did, he, um, he said, well, okay, I have polarizers and I can, if it's a reflection from the sky, I ought to be able to kill this polarized light that's reflected back. Um, and he did, and he found the ocean was much deeper blue than he thought. And um, it, it turns out, if you look at water, the ocean, if it was D2O, would be colorless. So let me see if you can figure that out. If it's H2O, it's colored. But if it's D2O, it would be colorless. And the reason for that is water has a very weak absorption band at 650. These are not chromophore-like absorptions. These are vibrational overtones. And these vibrational overtones, if you have three, mil three meters of water in, in a glass tube and you send white light, you, what you will get is a bluish tinge in the bottom. You fill the same tube with D2O, vibrational frequencies are shifted and that absorption goes to 965 nanometers. And so this water in fact looks white. So water is colored blue, not because of scattering, but due to absorption uh, in, 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 in the vibrational overtones. And that's what led Raman to, to study uh, the, the water and other things, and, and he discovered eventually um, what 
was at that time called a weak second fluorescence. Um, I have a question. You know that some of the beetles have uh, basically heterostructures where you could have polystyric liquid crystal, nematic liquid crystal, polystyric liquid crystal. Uh, you know, there was a nature materials paper back in 2005. And I was wondering, it looks like many beetles and butterflies found, you know, very nice high-tech solutions, but they are all very different. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, so the question... The, the real question is, why do beetles reflect circular polarization? And the answer is they, they deposit chitin in a helical sense, sort of like a colostric liquid crystal. But why would they want to do that in the first place? Uh, there are two reasons for it. Um, one happens to be that these things are very brilliantly colored. And the second is because of the helical structure, the mechanical properties of the exocuticle are just kind of incomparable with anything else. So it's very difficult to crush a beetle. Now, the beetle that you're referring to, which has a left-handed helix and an ordered layer, which is a nematic if you want to think of it that way, and then a left-handed helix. If the left-handed helix reflects the red color, the, or, the oriented layer, the, or the pneumatic layer, is, is a halfway plate, precisely made for red. And it then converts the right circular polarization as it goes through into left circular polarization and reflects 100% of the light back. Most of the beetles reflect 50% and some reflect 100%. So the other key question is, can the beetles sense circular polarization? Do their eyes have detection systems for circular polarization, and there are some behavioral studies that suggest they are sensitive to circular polarization. And I have no idea why they do that. And, and this, this paper in Nature Materials in 2005, you know, Neville and Cavanaugh discovered that these beetles uh, have uric acid in them in the oriented layer, which kind of unwinds the helix. Um, and I have no idea why, why these beetles go to such elaborate extents to do this. However, Neville did raise the beetles. It, it turns out the helical layer is deposited during night and daytime, and the oriented layer is deposited during nighttime. So you can actually tell the age of the beetle by looking at the cross-section of the exocuticle as to how old this beetle was before it died, because each layer is representative. It's it's night and day, night and day, night and day. It's it's uh, it's quite stunning. So they in fact raised these beetles in the dark, and so what you find is not the colostric layer, but just the nematic layer that's hundreds of layers thick. So the, the zoologists and entomologists have done a tremendous amount of work, but not really connected with the physics world. And then it's it's interesting that. Uh, that we are looking at these things only now. Neville and Kamenet did this in 1969. Are there more questions? If not, we will reconvene in 10 minutes. A little uncertainty principles. The number of centers a person belongs to times the IQ of that person is a constant. So you guys, uh, you guys are doing great. You don't belong to any any centers, at least not yet. And so your your IQ is essentially infinite. So the moment you belong to one center, you're downhill. It's downhill since then. So you know, I already belong to. The, there's two more. I didn't put on, but. Um, so my IQ is pretty pathetic. Right. So you guys are all much more brilliant than me, so bear that in mind. All right. How did you come up with this situation? <laughs> <laughs> it, it came from my uh, from my postdoc advisor who was in Saudi Arabia, and he had a he had a different uncertainty principle, Richard Stein's uncertainty principle. The amount of dollars times the quality of the papers is a constant. <laughs> So I, I tell them they let you out of Saudi Arabia after that. 
maybe they couldn't take uh, take them anymore. They said, "Well, all right, uh, get going." All right. Um, so uh, this story has its origins oh many, many, many years ago. Um, when I got very interested in, as I said yesterday, in color science, and, and the only things that I could do, um, you know, there, there are a lot of people who work in color color science, they all use pigments or dyes and things of that sort, and so I said, well, what in the world am I going to do? There are all these people doing really nice stuff and dyes and pigments. So it, it turned out I got interested in uh, color based on physical optics, and this is uh, even though I had worked on liquid crystals for ages, I had not spent time thinking about beetles. And, and I ran across a paper by Neville and Cavanagh in 1969 uh, that showed uh, that these beetles, in fact, reflect circularly polarized light and are metallic. And if you're rich enough to buy a, uh, a Mercedes Benz, and if you're even rich enough to have a certain kind of paint known as beetle paint. Basically, they are colostric pigments. The paint job on this Mercedes Benz is about $10,000. Right? So you can get a colostric paint on your beetle, uh, <laughs> on your Benz. <laughs> there is a VW <laughs> with the beetle paint on it, which is kind of cute. I don't have a picture of that, but I do somewhere. Um, and, and the idea is they, they make Merck has patents, umpteen patents on, on these colostric pigments that they can make emulsions of the polymeric materials and apply it as a paint. And what you find is these things are incredibly bright and incredibly metallic in color. Right? So that the first thing you look at when you look at this beetle is that they appear metallic. Their reflection, uh, as it turns out, is something not okay with this. Um, and if I were to look at this particular beetle in uh, left circular polarized light, uh, you get this nice green color. If you look at them with right circular polarizers, it's completely dark. Okay, so this beetle, in fact, reflects circularly polarized light. And, um, and I'm going to tell you a story that got started because I bought a very rare beetle that was $500 out of my own money. Uh, not NSF money, not any grant money, it's my bank account that spent that money. It's a very rare beetle that is incredibly red in color, and um, you can't, with colostric fluids, you can't generate that kind of a red with that hue. And I had it in my office as a decoration for a long time until my Slovenian student, Matija Cherne, walked in and said, Dr. Mohan, can I look at this? said, yeah, you can look at it, but don't break it. I'll kill you if you break it. Right. So what does he do? Promptly breaks it. <laughs> so the thorax of the beetle is gone. Right. So, it, you know, it, it, the beetle has been beheaded, even though it, it was a dead beetle to start with. So I said, all right, let's then spend time completely taking it apart anyway. So we do microscopy, and so we, we we went to the cheaper version. This is something you can buy for five dollars uh, or seven dollars, and we haven't still completely broken the uh, other one yet. And so, if you look at this under a microscope, the first things that stand out is uh, this is in just polarized light. Um, this was in right circular polarization. Um, if you look at it in just unpolarized light, and if you take, if you put this guy under a microscope in reflection mode, what you find is these beautiful uh, hexagonal, pentagonal cells. This is what the beetle looks like um, under a microscope. And what you will notice is that there is a very nice yellow reflection surrounded by green. And each one of these um, is 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 a hexagon or a pentagon, and you can put this thing under under a confocal microscope, and this is what the confocal microscope image looks like an XY section uh, of the beetle. And the beetle turns out has autofluorescence in it. So we don't really have to do anything. So the excitation is using um, either 488 or 588. I forget which one, but 
that's that's not relevant anyway. It's, it's a fluorescent image as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> and so what we then started trying to understand, what we wanted to figure out is, well, okay, what is the optics of this? And I'm not sure I'll tell you the complete answer for the optics, how it's fading in and out, and I don't like it. Um, and what gives rise to the optics? And secondly, what we wanted to know is, why are these patterns there? These patterns are completely analogous to all kinds of pattern forming systems. If you look at Van Leeuwenhoek instabilities, which is where you heat heat a fluid uh, from underneath, you can create these hexagonal convective cells. And whenever you don't have a hexagon, you will always have a pentagon. And if you have a pentagon, they always come in pairs of so pentagons and heptagons. So these are defects in the hexagonal cells of the Raleigh Bernard instabilities. And if you look at any other instability that has this kind of a scenario, you will always find. Um, so this is a generic pattern forming system, uh, so to speak. Again, here is um, here is a slightly different view of the same guys. Um, Michelson also studied this in, in 1911, and he attributed this to multilayer interference and across selective reflection. I guess he hadn't looked at the colostric fluid literature at that point in time. And so there is a very nice historical background given by Goldstein in Applied Optics. This was published a couple of years ago. And, and um, this is one of the reviews that I wrote a long time ago. One of the papers that I wrote, people have asked for so many reprints, but not cited it that many times. But that's OK. At least it's useful. This is used for teaching spectroscopy for non-science majors, right? So because this paper deals with uh, color and various ways of producing color. OK, so what we wanted to understand was uh, where these patterns come from and uh, what is the color? How do we understand the optics of this beetle? I'm not sure I'll tell you the answers to all of these, but I'll try and figure out what to do. OK. Um, just to give you an idea, this is what the, what chitin looks like. Uh, this is found on all kinds of things, exoskeletons of crab, lobster, shrimp, ants, beetles, butterflies, squids, octopus, whatever. Um, and what is interesting is I'm not going to show you any of these X-ray diffraction patterns. If I took the beetle exocuticle and did X-ray diffraction to look at the structure of chitin, and if I took the butterfly wings and look at the structure of chitin, or the orientation of chitin, they are essentially the same. Except the butterflies have different periodic structures that give rise to the color. In this case, the beetle deposits them in a helical form, but the organization of the chitin molecule itself and, and the structure of that um, is identical to that you would find in a butterfly or a beetle or um, on a crab or in a lobster. This is kind of. Uh, stunning to me. Although we haven't done uh, the X-ray scattering ourselves on, on lobsters and crabs, there are people who have done that uh, to understand what the structure of chitin is. And it turns out you'll get the same kind of diffraction from, from those. So the, the main thing that I'm going to tell you is that we think the chitin uh, that the beetle deposits is deposited as a cholesteric fluid. The analogy to cholesterol fluids have been made before, um, but the um, consequence of um, putting them down as a cholesterol liquid crystal is uh, the reason why these patterns are there, we believe. OK, here again is the same, same beetle. So one of the things we do then, since we are interested in pattern formation and, and we have looked at many patterns in our lives, um, we know how to characterize these patterns. I don't understand why this happens. OK. Um, so what we do then is we look at the map on a, in a light microscope. And then we convert this into, we find the centroid of each of these and map it into a Voronoi diagram. And all we are going to do then is ask, uh, what is the smallest uh, polygon that surrounds the point whose sides are the bisectors of the lines between the points and the neighbors? So if we had, if we had a colloidal crystal like this, completely hexagonally packed, then it basically has hexagonal cells as a Voronoi uh, analysis. This is used for looking at melting of colloidal crystals, melting of 
metals and things of that sort. So this is a nice way of characterizing how many different sided polygons are there on, on, on the beetle exocuticle and so on. So, so one can define an entropy which, which is defined as the probability of, or Pn represents the fraction of the 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, however many sided polygons you have, and the summation of all that. And so if, if it is all P6, then the entropy is, entropy is zero. It's basically perfectly ordered in this case. So what we do then um, is we take, take the image of the beetle under the microscope, uh, so this is a uh, locate the centroids of, of the dots using image, some, any image analysis software, convert them into, uh, into the Voronoi maps, and, and you can write MATLAB codes for this. And what you will find is these, uh, uh, the, the red ones are the seven-sided and the five-sided ones are the blue-sided blue, blue ones. I don't know why we chose the blue and red colors. Those of you who are interested in the politics of the U.S. might think about it. Um, and so in this case, um, so five, six, or seven-sided, you, you have the entropy for this particular system is 0.96, and, and we are looking at this image and calculating what the, what the disorder is on the, on the packing of these, these cells. Um, and so we torture the beetle, of course. Uh, we want to then see what kind of um, uh, the the crux is. If if I have a curved surface, it's very difficult to pack hexagons on a curved surface. This is something people who have worked on C60s or played soccer will will find out. And so, if I have a, even though the the cells themselves are small in 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 comparison to the overall curvature of the system. There is a dependence. If I look at the really flat parts, um, the hexag hexagons are larger in number than if I look at the really curved parts, and, and the number of the probability of the hexagons goes down in very highly curved parts. Even though, as I said, each individual cell is very small in comparison to the overall curvature of the beetle. Uh, despite that, you, you still have a dependence. So higher the curvature, the greater the disorder. And this is something you would have, one would have expected anyway. So this is, this is a full map having 17,000 points of the cells on the, on the, on the exocuticle of the beetle. Right? And so what, you will, what is interesting is that there are a significant fraction of five-sided and seven-sided ones, and most of the time they come in pairs. And this is something that's very common with all other pattern-forming systems. OK. So, so why we care about this, there are lots of reasons, and, and these are all some references if you guys are interested for you to go look up. Um, if I were to take a droplet, if I were to take a droplet of water or something and then try to pack, um, pack small polystyrene beads on them, this is work done by uh, David Weitz and among others, uh, what you will find again is you cannot pack um, in a hexagonal form on a curved substrate. So what you will find is these are all these scars that are left by the defects that are there. And these defects are completely analogous to polymer chains. Okay, and so you can ask the question, what is the end mean square end-to-end -end distance of this particular case? And do they scale like that, like the mean square end-to-end -end distance of a polymer chain? And the answer is that yes, they do. Even though these are defects, of packing of colloidal crystals, but the analogy to the polymer chains does exist, and the, mean, the statistics tell you that this thing behaves as a random walk. So what that tells you is this defect will be walking along the surface in a random walk. And, and this is kind of, kind of an interesting thing for me. But I, I, um, and, and there are lots of reasons why you want to study these things, uh, because lots of virus particles are all uh, spherically packed, um, and there are um, protrusions out of those, and these may be because they want to relieve, um, um, relieve the uh, surface um, packing imperfections that, that invariably exist because you have, a, you have to pack things on a curved, surf, curved substrate. And again, here are a whole bunch of other, other references for you just to 
if you're so inclined to go look at all these pattern forming systems because the the analogy is, is quite uh, quite interesting. So you can look at monodispersed bubbles. If you drink beer in the very, very initial stages, if you observe beer drinking very carefully, uh, other than paying attention to the beer, what you will find is the bubbles are monodispersed in the very, very initial stages. Um, and, and the froth will be monodispersed in size. It's a, it's a foam, but at any rate. And, and all of these things have certain, certain commonality in terms of how these patterns appear. And these are all interesting papers for you if you're interested to, to look these things up. Okay, now back to the Beatles. <clears throat> so if I if I look at in the reflection mode in the right field, um, what you find is that uh, uh, you have a yellow spot surrounded by green, and you may you may be able to pick up different colors that that are in the interstices of those. And again, we have not solved the optics of this beetle, uh, the, the optics of this particular uh, exocuticle. And if I were to come in with very large angle in dark field, what you find is that the central, central yellow spot disappears. And you now have a lot more structure and different colors showing up within each one of these individual cells. Okay. And so the question is, what is giving rise to all of these? What gives rise to the patterns? And what is the optics of this? If you use a microscope, then of course you can use the microscope in the normal way it's supposed to be used, or not use it in the proper way a microscope is supposed to be used. So you can change the aperture size of the light beam that comes in, and what you will find is this yellow dot, in fact, spreads out. Um, and becomes uh, occupies a larger area. In other words, it's diverging, so to speak. And that's the appearance you get. If you increase the aperture, the, the size of that yellow spot increases. So this is something I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on because uh, 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 Ivan has already spent a lot of time on this. All I'm going to tell you is we use confocal microscopy to look at the three-dimensional structure of this exocuticle of the beetle. And we're going to use the autofluorescence of the beetle to do this. And this was, in fact, the most striking image that, that we got uh, some time ago. And this tells you we, we are looking, these are XY sections as you go through the beetle exocuticle. Uh, this is imaged um, using a 100x oil immersion objective um, and using the autofluorescence of the autofluorescence of the beetle exocuticle. <laughs> <laughs> Thing walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. Therefore, it must be a duck. All right. Um, so this is the top and the bottom as we image through, and this is one of the uh, X Y sections. What you will notice is, in fact, these very nice nested arc-like structures. And now this can come about because of the dependence of the fluorescence on the orientation of the polarization or could be because of the concentration of the autofluorescence, but, but I don't think that's the autofluorescence, the concentration of the fluorophore changes, and it must be um, some kind of an orientation issue, and, and again, we're not able to quantify it, but the structure is, is quite, uh, quite remarkable. Each one of these then almost looks like the fingerprint texture that you would find in a cholesteric fluid if you were to use a confocal <laughs> microscope to look at them. And you can, of course, do a uh, 3D imaging over the entire beetle exocuticle. And what you will find, there are all these um, uh, uh, pores which are supposed to be there if, if, I have, if, I, if I have packing on a curved surface. And this is, this is something I will not spend a whole lot of time on, but we do know why they, they exist. Okay. 
Now, the beetle um, exocuticle itself, if I were to look at the uh, profile on the surface, it's completely smooth. Right? However, the three-dimensional structure, the imaging uh, exaggerates and tells us that there are these, uh, this is a magnified view of what you find in one of these things, that, that there is as if there's a cone. And this is, in fact, an optical uh, artifact. But the exaggerated height is an optical artifact, but not the fact that it's a cone-like structure. That's not an artifact. And, and the beetle is, in fact, very clever. It has a wax layer on top of it, so it, 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 these, these um, small uh, cone-like structures, even though they look completely exaggerated here, they, they are cones but the top surface is flat because there's a layer of wax on top of the beetle and you can melt away the wax and do an AFM and what you will find is in fact there's a shallow cone it is incredibly hot um, and so it, this was this was observed um, uh, years ago by, by SEM and one of the few papers in science that has been published that uh, that I did not find years ago is by, uh, by Anderson Pace in 1972. This is, in fact, a very beautiful paper looking at the analogy of the cholesteric fluid to the beetle. However, it tells you not everything published in science gets cited. This has one citation. One. And one reviewer for our paper that's coming out in science said, well, you know, Anderson Pace has already seen it. Well, he saw it only because we referenced it. Because nobody else has referenced it. Right. Okay, so here are more three-dimensional structures at higher magnification. And what was stunning, of course, is... Um, is the structural similarity to lots of things that uh, um, Yvonne showed me yesterday and to the work that was done by Paul Peronsky way back in 1995. Right? So this is, this is the top surface of the beetle's exocuticle that we are looking at and what you find is that these are all hexagons or pentagons and each have these nested archetype type structures on them. And um, People have known that the fact that this, this is colored and that it reflects circularly polarized light is due to the fact that there is a chitin is deposited as a cholesteric helix. And so here is a schematic of what the cholesteric fluid would look like. Um, and all, all there is is there is a twist as you go along the, um, if you want to think of it as a, as a pneumatic material that is twisted or taking a deck, deck of cards and twisting them and that would be a cholesteric fluid. If I were to uh, take this and confine it to a, uh, to a spherical droplet, you get these nice fingerprint uh, textures. And when the pitch, when the, um, pitch gets to be on the, same order, of the uh, same order of magnitude as that of the wavelength of visible light, you get selective reflection. And the selective reflection is circularly polarized according to whatever the handedness. If this is a left-handed helix, you get left circularly polarized light. If it's a right-handed helix, you get right circularly polarized light. Right. Um, and so this is a beautiful paper by Paul Peronsky talking about what the free surface of a cholesteric fluid looks like. So he had taken a side chain liquid crystalline polymer um, and looked at what the free surface might, uh, might look like and to our astonishment, uh, what we found was, I must not move. To our astonishment, what we found was that these structures are completely analogous. Now turn. These are completely analogous to the structures that we found on the beetles of the exocuticle based on the, um, based on the imaging. And Powell also had a very, and so these are sort of focal conic defects that are packed on the surface, and, and this is a schematic taken from his paper that tells you what might be the structure of these, um, of these focal conic defects. And so what you have is an underlying cholesteric layer, and then the defect packed 
um, in, in a particular fashion. And of course, the helical axis is tilted in the, in the defects in comparison to that of the um, underlying holospheric uh, helix. Okay, so this is the beetle that, that we have. This is the uh, focal conic of uh, uh, Paul Pinansky's uh, material. And there is, of course, a shallow cone. And if we fracture the exocuticle of the beetle and look at the uh, scanning electron micrograph, you will see these, these very nice nested arcs um, uh, appearing here. And this is the wax, wax layer that I was talking about. And you can see that um, in the, the wax layer, there is sort of a shallow cone, cone in this particular case. And what you find are these uh, very nice periodic uh, helical structures, and then you get these nested arc defects that are on the surface of the uh, surface of the exocuticle of the beetle, which we basically take to mean that the structure that is on the beetle must arise from the fact that when chitin is laid down um, on the exocuticle of the beetle, must be laid down as a cholesteric fluid, and of course it solidifies at a later point. And that's, that's really what we think is, is occurring uh, based on a number of studies on just the free surface of the cholesteric fluid. And, and you have some very nice images that, that show similar, uh, similar things. So at any rate, uh, what, we, what we believe are the reason for these patterns is we think that the beetle, when it deposits the exocuticle, must deposit the, deposit the chitin as a cholesteric fluid. Everybody has up to now pointed out that it, it is an analog to cholesteric fluids. I don't think it's an analog. It, it is when it is forming a liquid crystal. When it, is, when it is growing, it deposits this as a cholesteric fluid. And then, of course, it solidifies. And, and those patterns are then, then, um, then stuck on the exocuticle. Um, and um, and the optics of this is quite complicated, and we don't quite quite understand what is happening. And, and I will tell you um, that these these uh, yellow dots we believe are in fact the the defect behaves as a sort of a spherical lens, if you will. Um, and it is focusing, the focal point of that lens is somewhere underneath and it focuses that light source. And this is something we are working really hard to figure out what might be the optics and, and what might be the focal length. We need to compute that. The only problem with that is when the beetle solidifies its exocuticle, there are lots of other processes and we don't know the refractive indices, we don't know the orientation of the chitin. Um, although we do know chitin is oriented, but we don't know the extent of that. We don't know the various refractive indices, NE and N sub zero for the chitin. So there are lots of things we don't know. Uh, it, it just doesn't exist. Because entomologists don't necessarily, or zoologists don't necessarily care about all of these things. If I want to understand what the optics of this is, I need to know all of these, uh, uh, these values. We will see if we get them at some point in life. OK. So that's essentially all I have to tell you. And I'll stop here.
at one surface and then there was double reflection. Correct. I mean, retro reflection. And so you know that there is two times in the polarity. Correct. So, so what is the role of that in the What is the role of that? What is the role of the reflection in generating the interference? I don't think there is any role. So if I had a flat multilayer, right, which reflects, let's say, which reflects the uh, green, and if I'm going to have a, um, I can go back to that, that slide. for which I need my eyes. So this is what you're asking me about. Yeah. Okay, so this is a multi-layer that is built for for yellow reflection, let's say. And if I if I curve that substrate, as I'm doing here, for a light beam that's incident, the path length is very different. And the condition for that turns out to be blue. And, and that's all there is to it. And, and the beam, because it's a curved surface, it gets reflected twice. And the polarization rotates each time. And so, uh, other than that, I don't know what else I can tell you. Yeah, but uh, if, uh, let's say that one beam is normally incident. Correct. So it has only one time uh, change in polarization. Correct. And for another beam, and say suppose that is uh, for yellow color, say, for the center you talk about. It's not yellow color. They, okay, for normal incidence, the condition for interference is yellow. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. And if I were to take that multi layer and curve it, and for and if I have a beam that is coming and, and um, incident at that angle, my multilayer, because it is curved, the path length this beam sees is very different, and the condition for the reflection is blue. Yeah, but in that case, in both the cases, like for the condition of yellow color and for the condition of blue color, we have different polarizations. Correct. And but uh, when we talk about interference, orthogonal polarizations have no interference. These are two different interference phenomena, right? I, I have a multi-layer and I'm going to curve the multi-layer. And so I don't see what the problem is. Unfortunately, I don't understand what the problem of... You know, I have a flat surface and the interference condition is yellow for that. And if I curve this, for a light beam that's incident normal, the, the angle turns out to be very different and the condition for that is blue. Right? Because my path length has changed. Now, if I were to turn this completely on its end, and if the light beam is incident there, there is no interference, it just goes right through. So this is an angle dependent color. In, instead of Instead of the light beam coming at different angles, my substrate is curving. And so you get different interference conditions for the different light sources that are incident. You know, so basically I'm sending a parallel beam of light onto this. The light that is incident here is reflected yellow because of that condition. That's one interference. The light that's incident here has a different interference condition which happens to be blue. In between there will be no other like there may be. That's why the yellow is, is, is the bandwidth is white. Right. So it's not that these two are interfering. Yes. Do you get minuscule amounts of the other colors where it's not reflecting? It's not interfering with yellow. Well, I, I showed you. Right. So you see. It, it, to say that this is yellow in color is kind of a misnomer, right? So the, the peak has a maximum at 556, and the delta lambda for this peak is 150 nanometers. So are there other wavelengths? Obviously, right? So this this thing tells me, you know, it's it's from uh, full width half max is about 100, 160 nanometers, but the peak 
is it 565 or whatever it is, you know, 556 or 560 something, right? And that's what your eye is going to, your brain is going to tell you that's the maximum intensity you're seeing. Everything else is cut out. But if you if you put that in the in the context of a CIE chart, that's why it is here and it's not up there. If this was a very sharp peak, that would be up there, and that would be monochromatic. Um, if it was an interference filter like those used for generating monochromatic light, of course, this peak would, would have been seven nanometers, and that would lie lie someplace there on that curve. Are there more questions? Uh, if not, uh, let us thank... Uh